1943, Paramount Pictures received approval from the Production Code Office for Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler's screenplay of James M. Kane's 1936 novel, Double Indemnity. Double Indemnity tells the story of a wife who gets her lover to help her plan and execute a scheme to murder her husband so they can collect the life insurance money. Yes, from the moment they met, it was murder. Directed by Billy Wilder, the film starred Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray as the murderous couple, and it was a massive critical and commercial hit. Prior to this, Kane's novels were deemed by studios as unfilmable due to sex, adultery, murder, and all-around general unwholesomeness of their content. But Double Indemnity opened the door. A door Jack Warner over at Warner Brothers wanted to walk through with his film rights to Kane's novel, Mildred Pierce. Between 1934 and 1941, James M. Kane wrote three best-selling novels, Double Indemnity, The Postman Always Rings Twice, and Mildred Pierce. These hard-boiled tales of love, lust, and betrayal set in the sun and seediness of Southern California were populated by average everyday men and women, insurance salesmen, housewives, waitresses, and businessmen, and they lived in a world that existed beyond the glitz and glamour of Hollywood in the suburban world past the Hollywood sign. And one inhabitant of that world was Mildred Pierce. What's your name? Ida. What's yours? Mildred Pierce. Unlike Kane's other novels, Mildred Pierce doesn't revolve around a murder. It's a story centered around the domestic world of one woman who has to face the economic realities of the Great Depression in the decidedly average middle-class world of Glendale, California. Joseph Breen, head of the Production Code Administration, warned Jack Warner the book was unfilmable and would never pass the censors. Warner, undaunted, went through at least 12 screenwriters before submitting a final script credited to Randall McDougall. That turned the domestic drama of Mildred Pierce trying to raise her children in Depression-era California into a film noir light women's picture mashup. The script softened Mildred's obsessive love for her daughter, downplayed the adultery. It's for you, Mrs. Biederhoff. Murdered Mildred's second husband, Monty, not in the book. Ditched Vita's sudden transformation into an accomplished classical music singer and turned her into a murderous spoiled brat mini femme fatale, also not in the book. And it used flashbacks and voiceovers just like Wilder did in Double Indemnity. I was always in the kitchen. I felt as though I'd been born in a kitchen and lived there all my life. And with that, the unfilmable Mildred Pierce was given permission to film. Now, I feel like I must clarify. I love this version of the story. I think this version is its own thing and exists as a stylized 40s genre mix of melodrama and mystery. With the meat of the story toned way down and turned censor friendly. It's truly a showcase for the performances of Joan Crawford and Anne Blythe. It's definitely not a faithful adaptation, but I understand why it is the way that it is. Kane's novel is a very California story, and this version does maintain that sense of Southern California location, even if it does jazz it up with some Hollywood studio era glamour. But the setting of the Great Depression and all its hardships that Mildred had to endure is gone. Mildred's detailed struggle to find work and her very real worry over feeding and caring for her children is now a brief montage. Then there are a few tossed off lines referencing the war. You know, it's moments like this that make me happy that nylons are out for the duration. Well. This was an obvious reference to the wartime silk and nylon shortage, but other than that, the war is not mentioned. After an early preview, one moviegoer left a comment card stating she thought it was a wartime film, but she couldn't be sure because no men in the film, including Bert or Monty, who are both unemployed, is involved in war work or in uniform. So we're left with the strange, indeterminate setting of the film that ignores the war and the depression and the obvious economic lifestyle and cultural implications of both of these catastrophic events. But what does remain is the key settings of Glendale and Pasadena, California. They stand as symbols of two diametrically opposed ideologies of how money should be made and how money should be spent, especially for our little sociopath Vita, for whom class is everything. Vita's even willing to suggest to Mildred that she marry someone she doesn't love, her father's ex-business partner Wally, just to elevate the family status. You could marry him if you wanted to, but I'm not in love with him. What if you married him? Maybe we could have a maid like we used to, and a limousine, and maybe a new house. 
Vida really hates this house. And she hates Glendale. She is obsessed with Monty's class and pedigree. Oh, everyone knows the Monty Barragon. You play polo, go yachting, are an excellent hunter. I read the society section. So I gather. But that's all facade, because Monty's old money lifestyle no longer has an old money bank account. In fact, this small roadside building that Mildred finds and decides will be perfect for her restaurant is a building that Monty's family must sell because their fortune is in serious and rapid decline. Mildred buys that roadside building and through ambition, vision, along with the magic of the movies, transforms it into this. And she's an immediate success with a full menu and a glamorous first class establishment. This is a departure from the modest and efficient chicken and waffle restaurant Mildred opens in the novel. And speaking of modest and efficient, there's Joan Crawford and her characterization of Mildred, which is anything but. Director Michael Curtiz, in the early stages of pre-production, upon hearing the suggestion of Crawford as a possible choice as Mildred, actually exploded, saying, She comes over here with her hi-hat airs and her goddamn shoulder pads. Why should I waste my time directing a has-been? Crawford wasn't quite a has-been, but she had unceremoniously parted from her home studio of MGM after 18 years and had been labeled box office poison after a string of unsuccessful and critically panned films before coming to Warner Brothers. And she didn't so much have hi-hat airs, she'd taken a massive pay cut. But she was keenly aware that this was possibly the only chance she would have to salvage her career. So she was very selective in choosing her next project. Very selective. Then she heard about Mildred Pierce. Betty Davis, the queen of the Warner Brothers lot, turned down the role. Betty and Joan, that's another story. So did Curtis' preferred choice of Barbara Stanwyck. The role of Mildred is an interesting one. Kane describes her early on rather dismissively as a small woman, unremarkable except for a pair of voluptuous legs. In fact, I think in the novel he describes her legs more than he does her face. Molly Haskell observed in her 1974 study of women in the movies, From Reverence to Rape, Crawford was all wrong for the role. Kane's Mildred was tasteless, sexual, but not glamorous. And at the end, as she falls down the social ladder, hard drinking, overweight, and bitter. This is how Crawford looks at the end of the film. Just as glamorous as she did in the start. She can't help herself. Her Mildred has the air of Crawford's learned and careful refinement and elegance. She's all big eyes and shoulder pads. Her dresses for the early part of the film were actually bought off the rack from Sears, a very kind of real thing her character would have worn. But Joan had her seamstress sew in her signature shoulder patch, which drove Curtis nuts. And even with the history of Joan Crawford performances where her characters, like Mildred, work their way up from shop girls or stenographers or chorus girls to be the star or the success, Vida's insistence that Mildred is basically a lowbrow peasant just doesn't ring true. Because you'll never be anything but a common frump. But honestly, it doesn't even really get in the way either because Joan Crawford is giving the performance of her career. So on either side of this story of a very complicated mother-daughter relationship is a murder. I read a comment by author Stephen King where he called the murder ridiculous, and I don't know if I agree with that. I'm willing to accept a certain amount of outrageousness in my 1940s melodramas. Plus, unlike the book, Vita gets her comeuppance. Joan Crawford would go on to win the Academy Award for Best Actress, and the movie would settle into its place in film history. The novel, Mildred Pierce, was almost immediately overshadowed by the film, and the story cemented itself in popular culture as a genre combo of film noir women's film mystery. The Carol Burnett Show even did a comedic take on the story with the classic sketch, Mildred Fierce. Oh, I love Monty, and Monty loves me. He can't stand you. Yes, Mildred, I'm sick of you and the smell of Crisco. <laughs> when Todd Haynes revisited the material in 2011, he introduced all the elements downplayed or discarded in 1945. Um, and... 
this book was so much more concerned with the economic realities of the Depression years than I remember the film being. Haynes took Mildred Pierce back to its source. This is a mostly faithful adaptation. Haynes' concept was to film the series like a 1970s movie version of the 1930s, realistic and unvarnished, saturated in browns and greens and beige tones. And I have to say that the films made in the late 60s and early 70s set in the 30s are, in my opinion, some of the best screen recreations of that era. They lack the glossiness of modern historical films and they don't indulge in any nostalgia. Nostalgia. The series is loaded with period details, but they don't distract from the story, they aren't flashy. They're just the bits and bobs of everyday life, and they work to enhance the sense of realism. This version doesn't reference, homage, or even acknowledge the Crawford film. Some critics declared the miniseries a masterwork, hailing it as a return to authentic melodrama, realizing that it was not a remake, but its own interpretation of the source material. Others found it to be bloated and too long, with the general consensus of the lukewarm reviews being that Kane told his story in about 300 pages. Did audiences really need a five-part miniseries? I think that each Mildred stands in her own space as her own character, and it's possible to be a greater fan of one without dismissing the other. And in the end, both Mildreds end up back where they started, with Bert and Glendale. There are 8 million stories in the cinema cities. This has been one.